Alan, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me. Oh, my pleasure. It's so great to be with you. And I was saying to you before we hit record, when I started Cambro Conversations, I actually named it Cambro Conversations, the business and fitness podcast. And I've moved away from that because it was a little bit restrictive. However, yeah. I've always aimed to have conversations with guests like yourself who bring to the fore these lessons that you can learn from like a physical perspective and then apply them across multiple different fields because the people that listen to my podcast are not necessarily professional athletes, but they maybe treat themselves like an office athlete in terms of they compete in their workplace, in their business, whatever it is they turn their hand to. So that's what excites me so much about having you, Alan. But for those who don't know who Alan Stein Jr. is, how would you introduce yourself? I think the moniker that I most resonate with is coach. Uh, in, in theory, I'm a keynote speaker and an author and a podcast host as well. But, but coach is the moniker I most strongly resonate with. You know, um, having spent my entire life uh, deeply involved in sports and athletics, I just have such respect and reverence for coaches. And, you know, I, I also see the word coach as being somewhat synonymous uh, with the word teacher, uh, with the word role model, uh, you know. So uh, all of these things, I think, encompass a coach. And ultimately, a coach's job is to help people reach a level um, that they either can't or don't believe they can reach on their own. Yeah, I, I, I like that use of the terminology. And for those that are watching on YouTube, they'll see that you've got multiple things around your head in terms of pictures of people that you've worked with in the past. Because from my understanding, your coaching very much started off in, in the sports space. And now that's translated moving forward. But let's go back to those times in the in the sports space, Alan. And what was it you were up to in that space? So basketball was my first love. And, and I fell in love with the game at five years old. And I'm very grateful that here four decades later, uh, basketball is still a major pillar of my life. And I'm, I'm just so thankful that I've been able to make a living and build an extraordinary life around something that I'm so passionate about. So basketball has kind of been that red thread with, you know, through line of everything that I've ever done. And, you know, I, I certainly started my life as a very dedicated basketball player, uh, was fortunate enough to play up through the university level here in the States, uh, played at a small school in North Carolina. Uh, and while I was in college, I started to develop an equal love uh, for training and, and conditioning and, and strength and fitness and nutrition and mindset, you know, kind of all of the um, qualities that, that were above and beyond just the skills of the game. And so when I graduated college in the late 90s, I thought, what could be better than combining my original love of basketball with this newfound love of performance training and became a basketball performance coach right out of school? Uh, I chose to specialize primarily at the youth and high school level because that's where I felt I could make the biggest impact on their lives, uh, not just on their athleticism and on their game, but on their lives uh, as a whole. So I, I focused mostly at that level, but was able to work at two high schools here in the Washington, D.C. area uh, that have produced over a dozen players currently in the NBA. So I was working with some really elite level high school players, uh, and that opened doors to do some contract work uh, with Nike basketball and Jordan brand and USA basketball. So then I got a chance to, to, to observe and work alongside and work with uh, some really notable players, many of which you can kind of see on the pictures behind me. So I got to see, you know, what it takes for a, a, a younger player to climb that proverbial mountain and reach their goal of playing in the NBA. But then I also got to see what established players in the NBA did to sustain their, their momentum and their greatness uh, and to enjoy the process uh, along with it. And I, I now take all of those lessons and principles and mindsets and disciplines, and I show folks like you and I how to apply them to our lives and how to apply them to our businesses. And, and I just have so much fun doing it. For those younger players, when you are coaching them for the first time, are there any particular traits that you noticed and you thought, this means that this guy is going to make it. And make it is obviously subjective in terms of um, what that level gets to, but in terms of making it perhaps at the at the highest level in the NBA. Absolutely. And, and in a game like basketball, there are certainly some, some physical predispositions that would help one uh, play at an elite level. You know, in the game of basketball, it certainly helps to be on the taller side. It certainly helps to be quick and explosive and athletic certainly helps to have great hand-eye coordination. You know, it, it helps to be, um, while athletic, more of a slender frame and not carrying around a lot of excess body fat. So there's certainly a checklist of physical predispositions um, that, you know, someone would have the eyeball test. And you can see immediately whether someone looks like they have the potential to be an elite level basketball player. But one of the reasons I love my work so much is outside of 
the, the of trying to play a professional sport, if we're just talking about the sport of life or the sport of business, then the physical attributes are a lot less important. Uh, now, I still believe it's in everyone's best interest to be physically fit, to to work out consistently, to take care of their body, because I, I think we should view ourselves in a much more holistic approach. That if you actually exercise regularly and you take care of your body and you eat well and you get sleep, you'll have better mental acuity, you'll have better focus, um, you'll have more energy, and all of those things absolutely will add to your ability um, to, to run your business or whatever it is you do for a vocation. But back to your original question, um, a few of the things that pop out immediately. Uh, one, um, anytime I would see a young person that is coachable, uh, meaning they have enough humility to be open to feedback and enough humility to be open to learning from someone else. You know, when you meet a young person uh, and, and in full transparency, I was this way a lot during my youth. When you meet a young person that kind of thinks they already know it all, They've got it figured out like, hey, what can you tell me? I already know what I'm doing. Um, that's very much a red flag and a limiting factor. And I do think there's a lot of young people that are like that. And I was one of them. So part of my job was to help break through that barrier and to help show them that, yes, you have the potential to be a great player, but you're going to need some help. You're going to need some coaching and and uh, to, to learn this game correctly. So one is being coachable. Uh, another, there, there just simply has to be a, a passion. You know, they, they have to love the craft, you know, they, they can't just want to be a famous basketball player. They have to love the game of basketball. You know, they, they have to like being in an empty gym when no one else is watching during the unseen hours, working on a move or, or making shots. You know, if that's something they really enjoy, um, that, that will make it somewhat sustainable. And, and kind of an offshoot of that is, uh, they also need to be willing um, to focus on the basics and the fundamentals and to focus on the process. Um, if you, When I meet a young person that is just so heavily into outcomes and results, but isn't willing to do the work that gets the outcomes and results, then I know there's going to be a problem because most of what it takes to be a great player is built during the unseen hours. Uh, that's a, a phrase I've conveniently stolen from my good friend, Drew Hanlon, uh, who's a brilliant NBA strategic skills coach. At but least you've credited hours, them to Alan. That's polite of you to do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, the unseen hours are, are what you're doing when no one else is watching. And, and you know, the games that you play is, is kind of where you showcase what you've been working on. They're, they're kind of the test, if you will. But, you know, in order to do well on a history test, it just depends on how much you've prepared and how much you've studied in the, the days and weeks and months leading up to that. And it's the same thing for basketball. The players that are willing during the unseen hours to work towards mastery of the fundamentals to become the best player they're capable of are the ones that will end up playing well when the lights come on and the cheerleaders start dancing. So I, I would say you got to be coachable. You have to have a passion for the craft and you have to embrace the fundamentals and respect the process. And when I meet a young person that, that is open to those three things, then they have the potential to be as good as they're capable of becoming. It doesn't mean they have the tools to play in the NBA, um, but it means they'll maximize what it is that they're capable of. And you know that's what I want for my own three children, all of which play who play basketball. And that's what I would want for anyone listening or watching this right now is for you to be able to maximize the inherent gifts and talents that you have. Completely agree. One of the questions I was asked recently on a solo podcast was like, what's one of your greatest fears? And mine is to leave untapped potential on the table. Like true hell is when the you that you could have been meets the you that you maybe were because you didn't maximize the opportunities that were available to you. That coachable element is an interesting one though, because I think a lot of people, as you said, can be quite hard headed, particularly maybe the the youths that you're dealing with who've probably been recognized at some point in terms of having a lot of talent. Maybe they're on a scholarship. Maybe they're already playing in the team that they've always aspired to. Maybe they're playing a couple of years up because of their physical stature. They're like, okay, well, I've been pushed up to the, the senior team because I've got ability because I'm bossing it under 14s or whatever age group they've been in before. How do you sometimes have a conversation with somebody that is perhaps not immediately coachable because you must have been able to shift the dial in, in conversations previously? Well, the first thing you do, I believe you always lead with with empathy and with compassion. And, and as I mentioned before, 
I was pretty hard headed as a teenager. And even in my twenties, you know, I was one of those kids that thought he had all of the answers and, and thought that he knew it all. So I, I can empathize with how they're feeling now. Um, being able to fast forward several decades and having gone through some therapy and done a lot of self-work, I realized a lot of that was stemming from, from deep rooted insecurities that I had, you know, a feeling that I wasn't worthy on my own. So I kind of needed to have this false bravado to pretend like I knew exactly what I was doing so that, that people would like me. And, you know, I didn't realize that at the time, obviously didn't have the, the, the skills to realize that or the awareness, but that's where it's coming from. So when I meet a young person that appears to be a little resistant and hard headed, um, I don't try to, to fight with them. I don't try to coerce them. I certainly don't say anything to diminish or demean them. I lean in and say, hey, I was once just like you. And, and let me save you some heartache and some grief and make this path a little more fluid. The sooner you're willing to open up and be coached and to be open to feedback, the sooner you'll become a great player. So I don't try to fight force with force. Instead, I try to, 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 to have compassion and empathy. And that usually at least somewhat opens the door. Uh, the second thing I do is make sure that they understand that they're the ones that are going to reach this benefit. You know, you speaking to the player, you're the one that has the goal of playing at the college level or playing in the NBA. And all I'm trying to do is help you get where you want to go. This is not about me. This has nothing to do with me or what I'm trying to do. It is all about you. And with most people, when they understand that you're doing something for their best interest to help them reach their goals and dreams, once again, they'll start to pull their guard down uh, a little bit. So th those are two initial steps for sure. Um, and then the next thing is uh, you, you have to be able to, to back up what you're showing. Like you, you have to start giving them things, tangible things that will make them better. Um, there's, there's very few things that are as addicting to progress. You know, if, if this young person is somewhat resistant, but then you show them a few things that are in their best interest and they do those things, and they see themselves get better immediately, then they're all yours. Then they say, oh, absolutely. Coach Stein, he's here to help me. He has my back. What he's saying actually works. Now I'll do more of it. So that's kind of a almost like a, a three-step process or flow, if you will, to get someone to kind of lower their guard and, and enter that next phase. I think that third, third step is absolutely vital because if somebody can see the the benefits or the fruits of the labor, like ultimately a lot of what you'll be working on them with will probably be stuff that will come to fruition in the longer term. But if you can generate some quick one wins, then they jump on board. It's the same as some people who've always maybe struggled to lose weight, for example. If they can have that quick win over the first couple of weeks, maybe what they're doing is a little bit intense and a little bit unsustainable fine because it's got them on the path and they built a little bit of momentum so i can completely see if you can build a little bit of momentum a little bit of proof then they're like okay i'm on board this guy i can i, I can follow and the second thing you mentioned was passion and one of the things i've been talking about on the podcast a lot with guests is what area of work do you do that feels less painful and more like fun or play to you than other people and if you can find that and index on it then that typically will be a competitive advantage for you and that's not to say that you're competing with everyone else but if for example for argument's sake in my corporate career in the sales world i am more competent confident and i'm able to jump on the phone and do a cold call quicker than some of my colleagues that's fine because i spend led bandwidth on it because i can then just go and get on with it and do it for the rest of my day not a problem at all however it might be something like i recognize i'm not as competitive or not as strong when it comes to particular analytical work that's going on behind the scenes so i recognize i need to spend more time on that and that element of colin's better at making the phone calls and doing the presenting great index on that really really hard but make sure you're aware of the area that you're weak as well but the whole passion piece i think is absolutely massive and i guess somebody to make it in the nba there's probably very few that like see it as a labor of love i know some people play professional sport because it's what they've been kind of forced down the path of doing but very many of them that do make it or fulfill their potential as you said particularly ones that maybe don't play at the very very top level they must have some sort of love for it to do the hours of practice the fundamentals we spoke about there without maybe feeling like it's a it's an unnecessary chore for them oh absolutely and that's that's a very powerful distinction there's a difference between loving the fame and the notoriety and the money that basketball can bring you and loving the actual game loving the craft. Those, those things aren't the same. Now they're not mutually exclusive. You, you can certainly do both, but it's been my experience. The players that love the craft, they love the pursuit. They love working. You know, the, the Kobe Bryant's, the Kevin Durant's, the Steph Curry's, 
those guys love the game and they love the craft and they love the pursuit. Now they enjoy the fame and the notoriety and the money, but those things are simply a byproduct of loving the game. And uh, anytime I've met a player um, that maybe felt kind of like they had to play basketball because they were taller and more athletic, uh, they had to play basketball because they were naturally pretty good at it. And they saw this was, you know, maybe a way out of a previous circumstance, or this is a way that I can provide for my family, but didn't actually love the game it was just almost impossible for them to sustain a super high level uh, of performance over time because of that. So it, it comes back to being able uh, to love the game. And, and the beautiful part is when you learn to love the work and you love the process and you love the game, then everything else is just a byproduct. So even if you don't make it to the NBA, even if you don't make it to play at the university level, um, but you love the game, then you've already won. Because you're doing something that you really enjoy, something that you you feel compelled to do. So to me, that's what's what's most important. And it's I've always tried to encourage young people to try to find the intersection between what they love and what they're naturally pretty good at. Uh, and I call that your strength zone. If you can find where those two points intersect, um, as you said so perfectly before, it will simply make things easier, uh, less painful. It'll be more fluid. It doesn't mean that you won't still have a lot of hard work to put in but it just means you've kind of found your groove now. And that's what I encourage folks to do. And the beautiful part is as we get older, we'll uncover new passions and we'll develop new talents and skills. So that point of intersection will move over time, but I still think that's a really important uh, recipe for not only being successful and performing well, but for also having a very high sense of fulfillment. And that's one thing that I, I'm very proud of in my life is I've always stayed true to that intersection. As I mentioned before, that intersection started as a basketball player. I was I was pretty good at basketball and I loved basketball. So that was the intersection. As I got a little bit older, uh, I wasn't good enough to continue playing basketball, but I had a strong passion for performance training and I still loved the game and, and had some natural talents when it came to the ability to communicate, the ability to motivate, the ability to teach. So my point of intersection moved. And now in its current iteration, uh, as a keynote speaker and author, uh, I'm still in my sweet spot. I'm doing something I love and I'm doing something that I'm I'm fairly good at. Now, uh, some of that is some talent. Some of that is just good old fashioned work on the craft. I mean, I've put a lot into working on my ability to speak and the ability to, to deliver a captivating message and my storytelling ability. So it, it's I'm not saying that people should be trying to just ride on talent alone, but every single person watching or listening to this right now has gifts, has talents, has natural strengths, natural inclinations that they're very good at. And I think it's important to look for those, mine those, and then see where they align with, with what you love doing. A lot of that speaks to self-awareness, doesn't it? And it's clear that your self-awareness has been on a high enough level at these kind of three particular junctures in your life that you've talked about where you've been able to, okay, move on from this, okay, move on from this, all while being underpinned by this intersection concept where you're you're identifying what it is speaks to you at that moment in time in terms of effort, talent, combined with all the different things that you, you really care about. You mentioned some of the, the people that you've worked with there, so Kobe Bryant, um, Steph Curry, and, and of course, um, Kevin Durant as well, and I suspect they are some of the, potentially the photos but behind yeah. you as well. And um, I, I wonder, what did you learn from being up close and personal with that level of elite performer in like, like formative stages of the career, I guess? There's a trilogy of behaviors that unite all three of those those players in particular, but really any high performer. And the beautiful part is this is not uh, relegated just to basketball. This is for high performers in any area of life. And, and a good portion of it uh, has to do with habits, has to do with mindset, and has to do with the ability to focus or at least refocus the lens. And, and all three of those players that you just mentioned had really, really, really good work habits, uh, had a winner's mindset and had the ability to have hyper focus on what it was that they were doing in that moment. And, you know, those are three traits that, that I speak to businesses now all over the world about is, you know, if you can heighten your habits, uh, the things you do regularly, the things you do consistently and unconsciously, if you can heighten your mindset, your, your perspective on the world around you, and if you can heighten your focus where you choose to place your attention, um, if you can raise those three things, then everything else, you, you kind of raise the floor along with you. So those are three major focal points. Uh, and the beautiful part is, you know, these are things that you, you can work on on the individual level, but they're also things you could work on on an organizational level. 
And these are things that will help you in your personal life, but they'll also help you in your, your professional life. And that's the other reason I love the work that I do is while there are portions that you can compartmentalize, for the most part, we are talking about very broad general traits that have such high utility, they apply everywhere. I mean, I love the fact that I can deliver a keynote to a group of sales professionals and I can give them tools to be able to sell more consistently at a high level. But those are also the exact same tools that will make them better spouses, will make them better parents, will make them better members of their community, will help them improve their own personal uh, physical and mental well-being. So I, I love that I get to play in a playground that, that offers stuff that can help anyone at any time in any area of their life. No, I, I completely agree with Alan. Like, I, I like how uh, how excited you are about that, and how, how how you're able to communicate that 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 kind of transferability in in, in those skills. And I, I completely agree with that. What was it like being there in the formative years of what you would call some of the greatest players that have played in the NBA, in, in particular? Like, I think I think if we were to look at um, if Steph Curry in particular, he's he's known as one of the best like shooters of basketball that's ever existed, and that's from somebody that doesn't maybe watch a lot of basketball personally, being sure. being in being in the UK, but his his name has travelled far and wide to that extent. Yeah, I mean, I, I do believe, and I think there's a lot of folks that'll agree. I mean, Stephen Curry is the greatest shooter to ever play the game. And uh, certainly he he had some advantages out of the gate because his father was a really decorated professional player. His dad played in the NBA for a dozen years and was a really uh, tremendous long distance shooter, a great three point shooter. Um, but what folks don't understand, so certainly Steph was born um, with above average hand-eye coordination, above average balancing, you know, uh, certain portions of athleticism. But I still think the best gift that his father gave him was he modeled how important it was to practice. He modeled how important it was to get in repetition. You know, was he able to teach Steph uh, proper shooting mechanics at a young age? Yes, that is an advantage that maybe other, other parents don't have. But what was most important was he started planting the seeds very early and bringing Steph and his brother Seth to some workouts when they were basically toddlers just so they could start soaking in the fact that my dad is really good at basketball and my dad is always in the gym practicing basketball. That's not a coincidence. It's cause and effect. The reason my dad is a good shooter is because he goes in the gym to take game shots from game spots at game speed consistently. And that's, I think, one of the best gifts that any of us, you know, I'm, I'm a parent, I'm a proud father of three young children. And that's one of the most important messages that I want my kids uh, to, to, to learn, that if you want to be good at anything, you have to work towards mastery of the fundamentals during the unseen hours as often as possible. And that is what I think it puts Steph on that path or Steph on that path. And then of course, along the way, uh, I'm sure he, you know, um, was privy to being around NBA teams and other NBA players and coaches. And, you know, it was a, it was a perfect environment for him to grow. Um, but it's not like he's the only player that had a dad that played in the NBA. You know, there's been plenty that have done that. And yet Steph will end up as the best shooter of all time. So part two to that is, uh, he's he always holds himself to a very high standard of excellence. You know, uh, anytime I've interacted with Steph, he is meticulous about his footwork, his shooting mechanics. You know, he works on the basics and the fundamentals, but he works on them like they matter because they do. And most people don't. Most people just kind of go through the motions of doing things. They're logging hours, but it's not very deliberate or distinct practice. You know, there's a difference between a player that goes in the gym and just kind of casually shoots around for an hour and a player that goes to the gym and says, I'm going to work on this one move and I'm going to do it 200 times in a row. And I'm going to do it not only till I get it right, but I'm going to do it to the point that I can't get it wrong. I'm going to master this move. So in one hour today, I'm going to really make some headwind on, on improving this move. And then tomorrow I'm going to come back and I'm going to work on another move. And the next, and you can see the difference between someone that just kind of casually goes in to shoot and someone that goes in there with a distinct, deliberate purpose and intention to get better at something specific. And same thing with golf. Now I don't golf. It's not something I do, but it's been my uh, experience that my friends of mine that are good golfers, they find an area of their game that they want to work on. So they might just say today, all I'm going to work on is, is short putts on the green. 
You know, I'm going to spend an hour and a half out there and I'm just going to see how many nine foot putts I can make in 90 minutes. Or maybe they go to the driving range and they work on their long game, but they're not just always playing golf. That's part of it. They're figuring out exactly what it is they want to improve. They're very intentional and deliberate with that. And, and that's how they end up making such great strides. One of the phrases you were using continually there was basics and fundamentals. And it's interesting that you raised that people would maybe go in and not practice particularly mindfully and just kind of freewheel and do the thing. And I think that probably happens more often when you are talking about things like the basics and the fundamentals, because of course, particularly with the level of operating that we're talking about, they would maybe be an assumption that of course they're able to do the basics and the fundamentals. But you're saying there that people like Steph Curry are in there grooving the basics and fundamentals continually. And that's something that anyone that is playing at that particular level it's a given that they're probably going to be relatively good at that but instead he's going in there and just being like well i'm still rinsing and repeating this particular type of shot or this particular footwork drill that I, that you maybe consider basic but i'm going to do it and 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 doing it with a level of intent that really matters because you've seen people who maybe have lifted weights for a very long time they'll do their warm-ups like quite casually they're not too fussed about it because there's not much load on the bar they're not particularly worried they've done the technique many many times but then if you see somebody who's like a true master every single repetition every single warm-up every single thing they do is done with such intent that it could be that it was for a one rep max or for like the elite performance so in the same way that Steph Curry's maybe practicing a particular shot he's doing it like it's in the final for whatever tournament he's playing in rather than just another shot in practice yes so well said and when you as you continue to progress and develop, it doesn't mean that you only do the basics and the fundamentals. These guys still graduate to doing more advanced moves and more advanced techniques. It just means that they never leave the basics and the fundamentals. That is always the foundation to which everything else is built. And the beautiful part uh, about kind of this compounding interest mindset is a guy like Stephen Curry doesn't have to work on basic footwork or basic shooting mechanics for three hours a day. He can do it for 15 minutes a day, but he does it every single day. And when you do something, say, for 15 to 20 minutes and you are completely focused, you are not going through the motions, you are being precise, you, you, you're doing it with enthusiasm. I mean, when you do that for 15 to 20 minutes a day and days turn into weeks and weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and at a player of his level, now years turn into decades that's when you start having a level of mastery. So uh, I'm certainly not implying um, that the best of the best only do the basics. I'm saying they never leave the basics. That is always a staple of what they do. And, you know, if you were to go watch, um, you know, and, and I know these are all United States references, but if you were to go to watch Duke basketball or, or you go watch the, the New England Patriots or the San Antonio Spurs, you know, you would see that the fundamentals are, are a fabric of what they do during practice. You know, you're talking about an NFL team and, and, and I know the Patriots aren't as great as they were when Tom Brady was there, but you know, the, the Patriots, there's not a practice that goes by that Bill Belichick does not have them doing some type of blocking and tackling some type of throwing and catching, you know, same thing with the San Antonio Spurs. I, I know they're not the dynasty they were of, of yesteryear, but Greg Popovich has those guys doing footwork and shooting mechanics and, and basic ball handling drills. So it's about never leaving the basics and any high performer that I've met in, in entertainment, uh, in, in acting, in the arts, in sports, in business, that is a, another through line. They don't leave the basics. They never think the basics are beneath them. Um, that is always a staple uh, of what it is that they do on a regular basis. Absolutely. And one of the third qualities that you mentioned was focus. And that is such a crucial thing in, in all areas of life, as you were saying, because I think nowadays we're more distracted than ever before. We're, we're easily taken out of the, the kind of zone of flow and everyone wants and desires to be in that flow state. It feels amazing, doesn't it? But we're always dragged out by notifications or pressure about what's coming next or what we're thinking about in, 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 in the future. So for these high performers, their ability to be very focused, even when it is uh, maybe mundane would be an unfair term but maybe a very basic drill that they've done so many times over before but they're so focused on it they get the most out of the opportunity to do that and then of course they then graduate to the more advanced stuff during the warm-up as it progresses up towards towards game day or to, towards the kickoff time for the match oh absolutely and i actually think mundane is a fair word i i think the basics they can be mundane they can feel monotonous um they're at risk of seeming boring 
if you aren't completely locked in, dialed in and giving it everything that you've got. And, and one of the thing that I tell players is, you know, yes, I, I know that, that doing this footwork drill is, is doesn't have a lot of sizzle is not the sexiest thing you've ever done. Like I understand there, you might feel that this is a little bit boring, but there's nothing boring about winning. There's nothing boring about improvement and getting better. You know, there's nothing boring about mastering your craft. So even if you don't, find the drill itself very stimulating, you should find high performance stimulating. So sometimes it's a means to an end. And I would never imply that every single drill or, you know, it's the same thing with fitness. You know, uh, uh, many of the foods that we need to eat consistently to, to, to be physically fit. I mean, it's not the most exciting dish that you could eat, but it's a building block, you know, and and I don't, I'm not an expert in that area, but I have friends that, you know, have competed in bodybuilding and fitness and, you know, half of their meals are, you know, like steamed rice and grilled chicken with nothing on top of it. And yeah, of course, that's not the most delicious meal of all time, but you will thank yourself for eating that when you step on stage and you have very low body fat and you, you know, you're, you're, you're showing your best self. So some of these things um, we have to, if we don't love what we're doing in that moment, we have to love what we'll get out of doing it in that moment. And that, that I think, is, is a very important distinction and one that I have to remind folks of all the time. It's much easier to stick to the process when you know what the, the, the outcome and the goal of the North Star is. But equally, understanding that during the process, just trying to find as much enjoyment or as much fulfillment from the process as possible. And fulfillment is a term you've used already. But ticking off those boxes can feel like a sense of a, a sense of accomplishment can't it and if having these particular meals is leading you towards something else while of course understanding that this is a building block in the in the, in the grander scheme of things it's probably easier to adhere to that than um than, than than to kind of be tempted to wonder absolutely you know i one quote that's always resonated with me ever since i was younger is and 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 i don't mean this literally this is more metaphorically but don't dress for the job you have dress for the job you want. And, and I've always remembered that. And, and that's another thing that I'm constantly reminding folks of is don't have the, the, the habits and the mindset and the focus of where you are now have the habits, mindset, and focus of what it's going to take to get to that next level. So, you know, if, if you're playing in middle school and you want to be a high school player, you need to start behaving like a high school player. Now, if you're in high school and you want to play at the university level, well, you need to start behaving like a university level player now and, 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 and so forth. And if, if you're a sales professional, but you want to be a world-class sales professional, then start doing the things that world-class sales professionals do regularly. So uh, always, and this is not about um, avoiding the present moment. The, the, these are separate conversations. This is about behaving like a champion in order to become a champion. You know, you have to have the habits and the disciplines and the mindset of a champion before you'll ever be crowned one. So uh, I also want to make the distinction. This is not the same as fake it till you make it. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge believer in that. Um, that's just a, a preference of mine. It's it's not to say those that do like that, uh, you know, that that concept are, are wrong by any means. It's just never felt right to me. There's always been something that's felt a little phony and disingenuous, almost as if I'm pretending to be something that I'm not. Uh, that is not the same thing as trying to adopt the behaviors of the person you're trying to become. So the very first thing I would tell any team uh, or any individual is if you want to become a champion, you need to start behaving like a champion right now. I don't think it's ever been easier to see what the top performers are doing because of the insight we get through online, through social media, through podcast interviews. We can find out what their habits, what their practices are and start to mimic those. And I don't think, um, like you say, fake it till you make it. It's very much more like identifying and emulating. So like understanding that these are the habits that this particular gentleman has. If I can emulate some of those and add those into my my, my daily life, then I can see improvement. Maybe I won't reach his his um, exact level because he's got different genetic potential than me. He's got different characteristics than me. However, sure. I can employ some of the things that he does to give myself the best possible chance of reaching my own potential or as close to their potential as possible. And I think there's a lot of value in the online world now where you can see those habits and those practices and those routines and say, okay, which of those can I realistically do with my lifestyle and which of what parts of my lifestyle can I adopt and change in order to try and emulate this as closely as possible? So well said. And I love that. And that's an absolute massive advantage to the interconnectivity we have now 
uh, and the transparency that can be shown on social media and through podcasts like this. But I will say with a slight, there's a slight red flag and a disclaimer. You have to have high discernment with who you're following and what you're watching, because there are a lot of people that only post the after picture. They're only posting the success. They're only posting the, the nice cars and the houses and the money. They're not actually sharing a whole lot of what they did to get to that level. And that's what's most important. You know, what, what I, we can easily turn on ESPN and watch the highlights from, from last night's Warriors game and watch what Steph does when he plays, but that's not really showing us what he did to get to that level. Because ESPN is not in the gym with him when he's by himself at 11 o'clock at night on a Thursday after practice is over and he's in there making 500 shots. We're not getting a chance to see that. And that's sometimes it can be social media can be a tad bit misleading because it's almost an illusion. It's like, OK, well, here's everything. You know, same thing with fitness. You see a picture of somebody who is ripped head to toe and, and has all of, you know, as this amazing physique but you didn't necessarily see what they did to earn that. You didn't see that they went to bed at nine o'clock last night. You didn't see that they ate grilled chicken and steamed rice three times that day. You didn't see that they spent an hour on the Stairmaster, you know, uh, to, to, to burn extra calories, to have an extra level of leanness. So we don't always get to see that. And to me, that's the stuff I would love to see amplified and shared more. I wish we would, as a society, start shifting away from results and outcomes and focus much more on the process and then just have the faith and belief those outcomes are going to come and they are important. It's not that I'm anti-outcome. I just think it can be misleading if you don't see what it took to actually get there. I understand that entirely. And I think that's where long form content like a podcast like YouTube comes in because you do get to see the kind of the behind the scenes, you get to see the behind the curtain and understand a little bit more around how exactly these things are conducted and you probably get a little bit more realness than the kind of more filtered lifestyle that you see on online. It, it, it links into something that I've been talking about recently. We, we did an episode, it will come out as a Christmas special called uh, Unpopular Opinions. And one of my friends' unpopular opinions was that comparison is not the thief of joy. And for me, I completely agree with that because if I was comparing myself to the leading podcasters, I can look at how they conduct themselves, their habits, their routines, how they structure episodes, the type of guests, the type of conversations, the way they structure their clips, their introductions and all these things. And of course I could be jealous or unhappy that, oh, I've not, my podcast hasn't grown to that same extent, but equally recognize that, no, I'm not comparing myself to where they're at. I'm comparing myself to how they conduct themselves and how they hold themselves. And I can then identify and work backwards in terms of what within my budget and within the time allowance that I put towards this project, can I uptake on and, and, and put forward? And for me, comparison is not the thief of joy. It's more of a target in that regard. And I can start to work towards it in like a, in, in an aspirational way and emulate factors that I find inspiring. Oh, I love that distinction. For me, I would say comparison can be the thief of joy because if you're comparing outcomes and results, that's where I think it can rob you of, of feeling good. If you're comparing processes and habits, like you just said, then absolutely. I think that's a very powerful tool. I mean, you know, when, when I'm looking at other keynote speakers and there's so many of them that I have so much respect and reverence for, that's what I look to compare. You know, uh, I compare stagecraft. I compare their their mastery of storytelling. I compare their energy and their physicality. And while I never try to be them, I try and say, okay, can I have the same level of mastery over my content that they have over theirs? And I find that type of comparison um, to, to, to be incredibly stimulating and motivating and inspiring. But if I sit back and go, well, they're on bigger stages and they have more Instagram followers and they get bigger fees, that can lead to a path of feeling less than. So uh, I, I agree with you and, and your, your colleague. It just depends on what we're comparing. And I love that you brought up that you want to compare kind of processes and habits and disciplines uh, right on with that. Absolutely. Completely agree. I, I do think that James Clear's Atomic Habits moved the the goalpost for a lot of us when we consider these things because I think it was so focused on process rather than outcome that a lot of us now look instead of like for example how many Instagram followers that person's got how many downloads what fee they're getting for for speaking on stage what events they're speaking at we look instead at like as you said their stage presence their process how they turn up how they present themselves maybe even how they market themselves like what are they doing in terms of what platforms are they on what what what, what how are they turning up so I really really like that and I think there's a lot of credit for um 
James Clear's focus on process, process, process. And then, of course, when when you're amplifying that message or all the work that you're doing, Alan, I think that's very, very helpful for people to to hear because we, we need to hear it from multiple messengers over and over and over again until society kind of moves away from this outcome, goal-based um, living that we've always had. Most certainly. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up James. I mean, I think James is a perfect example. Uh, in full transparency, um, I've been a, a loyal follower of James' work for – geez, probably a decade now. Um, I would say that we're friends. I mean, he and I have met on numerous occasions. I've had him on my podcast. I, I think the world of him. Uh, I personally put Atomic Habits on the Mount Rushmore of books that I've ever read in my life. Uh, I, I've read the physical book twice and I've listened to the audio book twice. I think his book came out in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, in the last five years, I've basically averaged reading or, or listening to it once a year. It's that good. But here's a perfect example. So on one hand, someone sees James Clear wrote a book that I think at present has sold like four or five million copies. I mean, it is, it's been on the bestseller list since it came out, you know, five years later. So an extraordinary success. But unless you really dive into it, you don't realize all of the bricks that he laid to get to that point. You know, James wrote a weekly blog. And when James writes a blog, I mean, he... He is focused on delivering content and he wants that blog to be as valuable as possible. It's not just kind of let me throw a few thoughts out there. I mean, he wrote a very intentional and purposeful blog post once a week for, I think, seven years before he even started to write Atomic Habits. And then writing Atomic Habits was a couple year process. So uh, not only did James hone his writing craft and his skill every single week by writing a blog, he also built up a very loyal audience brick by brick. Uh, if I have my numbers correct, I think when Atomic Habits came out, he had about 750,000 regular loyal blog subscribers. I think he's now doubled that list. It's probably close to 2 million now, but he built up an audience and he built up his craft. Combine that with the fact that he wrote a brilliant masterpiece of a book None of us should, should be surprised that he sold 4 million copies. He did it the right way. And I can even say in full transparency, I'm I'm very proud of the, the two books that I've written, but I didn't do that for either one of them. I didn't spend, you know, eight years writing a weekly blog before Raise Your Game came out. And I, uh, you know, and, and I can say that. I, I don't say that to diminish myself. I say that because if I'm ever sitting around wondering why James Clear has sold four or five million books and I haven't. I know the answer. Like I did not follow the same process that James did. So I say that with nothing but reverence and respect for him. He deserves all of the success that he's had with that book. Uh, and and I'm very thankful that he wrote it and put it out into the world. But it's something that I can own myself. And that goes back to, as I move forward, I want to be able to adopt and emulate the process that James has used, but not be worried about the fact that who sells more books. 100%. That is so well explained in terms of understanding the process that's happened for other successful individuals and then picking the parts that you need to apply to reach the level of success, which you feel that you're personally capable of as well. And and speaking of one of your books, in Sustain Your Game, you mentioned that before each show or each engagement where you're speaking, you remember four particular words and it, they all begin with P, which helped me remember them as well. So poise, presence, personality and presentation. What do those four different words all mean to you? Ultimately, when it comes to speaking, I think what's most important is realizing it's not about you. It's about them and them being the audience. And uh, each one of those words, um, I try to interpret in a way of, of if I can master this quality, how does that add more value to the listener or the, the viewer, the person that's sitting in the audience? You know, it's it's very easy to fall into the trap of let's just call it motivational speaking of wanting to go up and making it all about you. Here's what I've done. Here's who I've worked with. Here's why you should listen to me. And, and there have been times where unfortunately I, I kind of skewed down that path, um, but it never really resonated. Now I realize that, you know, yes, I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of the experiences I've had and the people I've worked with. But all that matters is that I can share a lesson from those experiences that's valuable to the audience and making sure that the audience has something tangible that they can take away. To so interject there, Alan, every time that we've spoken about particular individuals that you've worked with from your past during this discussion, it has been as part of a wider story, which has a point and a lesson to it. So I can completely see that you you live that value and that aim of yours. 
Oh, well, thank you. And, and that's, and that's certainly the goal. Now, the reason that I intentionally lean into, let's just call it name dropping of some recognizable people is I feel strongly that's in the benefit of the listener and the viewer. I'm not doing it for me. I'm not doing it for my own ego. I'm not doing it to brag. I'm doing it because if I tell you that this is a lesson that I learned from Kobe Bryant, and here's how you can apply it to your life to make your life better, it's going to have more cachet and more credibility than if I simply tell you what the lesson is. And I, I learned that very quickly. I mean, uh, I can walk into a room of high school basketball players and tell them it's important to work on the fundamentals and they'll probably roll their eyes. If I tell them that is the lesson that I learned from Kobe Bryant back in 2007, that he said, great players never get bored with the basics. It, it resonates differently. So I'm saying his name to benefit the audience because it's going to get them to lean in a little closer. It's going to get them to open their ears up and listen a little bit more intently. So yeah, to me, the, the key to being a communicator in any form uh, is to make it all about the recipient and make it all about the person that you're trying to share with. And when you can do that, then they're going to put their guard down and they're going to be open to what you have to share. Yeah, that's that. That's so powerful. Another another P word there. We like our P's in this podcast. Um, <laughs> I uh, no, I I really enjoyed that. And when I was thinking about your your four P's, are those just like affirmations or words that you just remind yourself on, Alan? Or how how do you structure that? Yes, and there there are things that I constantly need to remind myself every single time I take the stage. And you know the the reason for using those words you know, those words and using somewhat of an alliteration uh, is to make them stickier and more memorable for those that are receiving it. But yeah, there's a handful of things that I have to always remind myself before I take the stage. But the first one I always say to myself, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about them. And I, I have to remind myself of that. Um, I also have to remind myself because um, I get so passionate about what it is that I'm sharing that I can often get what I call coach face. And, and I can almost have a scowl and, and I can almost have an intensity level. And I've had to learn that in order for the audience to receive the message more openly, I have to be warmer and I have to smile more and I have to lower the volume of my voice. So I have to do these things to make it more palatable for them. And that, I mean, that really, I, I keep saying the same thing over and over, but I can't stress enough in communication. It's all about the person receiving the message. It's not about you as in this case, the speaker. But same is true for if you're a writer, if you're a teacher, if you are a podcast host, it's how can I be chameleon-like enough to deliver this message in a way that's going to resonate most effectively with the person on the other end? Yeah, I've recently been reading your LinkedIn and you were posting about how you can deliver feedback. And I think it's something that everyone struggles with in the business world in particular, because sometimes it can feel like it's quite confrontational. It can feel like it's a little bit um, undermining somebody. And you shared a story about when you went to watch your son Jack play basketball in Lancaster. And over the weekend, the first couple of games, you noticed that he was playing a little bit timidly, a little bit within himself. How did you deliver feedback to him that was successful enough to kind of move the dial for him and make him perform a little bit better? Every dynamic is going to be a little bit different. Um, but in most dynamics, I believe you need an opt-in from the person that you need to give the feedback to. You need to get their permission. You know, unsolicited feedback. I know there are times where you have to do that if, if you are the employer to an employee. So I, I, I'm not trying to, to, to paint this with one broad stroke, but generally speaking, in order for any type of feedback to be used and to be helpful and to resonate, the person you're giving the feedback to has to want it or has to ask for it or, or be open to it. So, you know, with my own children, I want them to feel empowered. So I use language like, you know, are you open to hearing some feedback that I have? And if they say no, then I respect that and I give them space and I don't say anything to them in that, that moment. So I want them to feel like they have the keys to the car. Now, as we, th we kind of started our conversation with this, talking about one of the ways that you get people to lower their guard is by reminding them that this feedback is actually a gift for you. Th this has nothing to do with me. I get nothing out of sharing this with you. You're the one that's going to benefit because I have some things that maybe are blind spots that you're not aware of, uh, have some things that if you make these tweaks, it will actually help you improve. So part of it is, is creating a relationship and creating a culture that feedback is a gift. Feedback is not punishment. Feedback is not being disciplined. Feedback is a gift. And 
who doesn't want to receive a gift? You know, we all love them. We're, it's, we're recording this around the holidays. I mean, everybody loves gifts. So it's getting them to, to realize this is a gift. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I care about you. And that was really what I wanted my son, Jack, to understand. I'm going to tell you some things that might be a little bit hard for you to hear, but I'm telling them because I love you. You know, if, if I just ignored this and didn't share anything with you, you know, then, then you would miss an opportunity to get better. But I gave him the keys and he was the one that said, yes, please share this feedback with me. And uh, I shared with him as honestly and as openly as I could. Um, also realizing that what I'm sharing with him or what I shared with him was simply my perspective. You know, it wasn't the truth. It was my truth. And he may view things differently. And when you share feedback with someone and they view things differently, then that should be an invitation to have a very open conversation to discuss. So I'm all about making as many interactions as possible, kind of a, a two-way conversation like we're having here. I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but I, I want this to be more of a two-way conversation in less of a, let me just tell you to my son. I, I want to hear his feedback. I want to hear you know, his feedback on my feedback and the things that I just shared with you. What stuff do you agree with? What stuff do you see differently? You know, what's maybe something you're thinking or feeling that I'm not privy to. So now you can help give me a gift by letting me see some things that I wasn't quite understanding. So, yeah, I, I think as a society, we need to move away from uh, feedback being the second F word. And we have to let people know that that feedback is a gift and feedback is a prerequisite to high performance. It's not a it's not a nice to have. It is a necessity. And the only way you can improve in something is if you are open to competent feedback. Yeah, undoubtedly. Did you find that easier to deliver to your son or to some of the players that you've worked with over the years? It, interesting question. It's a little bit of both. I mean, you know, I, I love my I love all my children, but in this case, I love my son unconditionally. And I want to do anything I can to help empower him and, and help him improve and make him feel better. So, you know, there is a, a high vested interest in that. Um, but it's also hard to have a conversation where you're looking someone in the eye that you truly love and you have to say some things that might sting in the moment. You know, I mean, because the feedback I shared with him wasn't necessarily easy for a 12 year old to be able to take in. So on some level, if you're giving it to, you know, giving feedback to someone in the business world, you know, hopefully you do care about them as a human being, but you most likely don't love them unconditionally the way you would love your own child. So, so there are definitely some differences and some nuances there, but, uh, but overall the general principles don't change. If you care about someone and you care about the organization or the team, you'll have the courage to share people, share with people some honest, open feedback, and hopefully they'll be, you know, open to receiving it. Yeah, really interesting, Alan. I, I was interested in that. And, and I know Jack is a, is a twin, so you've got two twin boys. How does it differ? Do you find one of them, um, you have to deliver feedback in a different way to the other? Very much so. Yeah, that's such an insightful comment. The Even though they are twins, um, one of my sons is a little bit more sensitive. He, he, you know, when I share things with him, I'm always honest and I'm always direct, but I have to sugarcoat it a little bit. I, I have to make it a little sweeter for him to be able to take it. Whereas my other son, I can be much more direct. I can be much more factual based. I don't need to, to dress it up and, and put a lot of sweetener on it. So I've learned how to best communicate with, with each one of my children. And, you know, there's uh, one of the, the principles I learned as a coach is you don't necessarily treat everyone equally, but you treat everyone fairly. You know, you, you treat everyone with respect but you don't treat everyone equally. If one of your players or one of your children or one of your sales professionals needs more of your time, then you give them more of your time. It doesn't have to be equal. You know, if, if one of my children needs new basketball shoes, I don't buy new basketball shoes for all three of them. I buy new basketball shoes for the child that needs them. And then when someone else needs them, I'll buy it for them. So to me, that's being fair, but it's not being, it's not being equal. Com completely understood. And last question, Alan, before I before I ask you where people can find you, um, a lot of the people that would listen to a podcast like this one, as with many people in the general population, one of their biggest fears is public speaking because I think there's a there's a tribal fear around, isn't there? Because you're out in front of everyone else, you're facing potential rejection. You now do that for a living. What have been the main ways that you've sharpened that axe, that tool, and become better at public speaking? 
first and foremost, and and I love this through line again, another something where we have symmetry throughout this podcast is taking the focus off of me and putting it on being a full service to the audience. If I'm so worried about what I look like and what I sound like and what everyone is thinking about me, that has the tendency to heighten anxiety and to heighten nerves. If I just view myself as simply the messenger, you know, this is not about me. This is simply about what I can offer you to make your life better. Then I shift the focus off of me and I put that spotlight on them. So that's, that's certainly one of the main ones. I find that anytime I'm a little bit anxious, a little bit worried, a little bit nervous about anything in life, not just speaking, it's because I'm looking at myself and I'm just worried about me. And as soon as I start thinking more about how can I be of service, how can I deliver something that's impactful to others, that, that helps. Uh, the second thing certainly is, is preparation. You know, I find that the more prepared I am for a speaking engagement, then the, the less nervous I'll be, the more excited I'll be. You know, have I done my due diligence on the group that I'm going to be speaking to? You know, have I taken the time to really get to learn them and their pain points and their challenges? Uh, have I customized the program that I think is going to be a great fit for them? Have I rehearsed it over and over until I can just be present on stage? I don't, I don't have to have notes and slides and I don't have to worry about whether or not I memorized it. I can just go up there and be present because I've done it so many times. You know, when Steph Curry steps up to the free throw line to shoot a free throw, he, he's not thinking or worried about any of the shooting mechanics or footwork. He just goes up there and he lets his mind go blank and he just lets his muscle memory kick in. And it's the same thing with, with speaking. And then the, the last thing I'd say is I, I can step back and put enough perspective on this, that this speaking engagement, even if it's going to be in front of 20,000 people, even if it's going to be across the pond and it's going to be in the UK and it's an international uh, event, even if it's for a huge recognizable brand, it's simply only a, a little small piece of the totality of my entire life. If for any reason this one rep doesn't go as great as I would hope it would go, it's not going to be the end of my life. You know, it doesn't mean it'll be pleasant. doesn't mean I won't be disappointed. But when I step back and I look at a wider frame, it's just another speaking engagement. And, and I don't say that to lessen the importance. And I don't say that to lessen my preparation. I say that because it can relieve a little pressure. If you think my entire existence hinges on delivering a perfect keynote right now, you've now raised the stakes to a, high, a, a height that, that's probably hard to shake those nerves. Brilliant perspectives, Alan, and uh, a little bit of an overlap in terms of how I prepare for prepare for big meetings and work and also uh, podcasts as well. The only thing I add is um, a lady called Hannah Huseman was on the podcast. She's a mental performance coach at the yep. Texas Rangers, and she's she flipped the language around nerves to excited. So before a podcast, if I'm nervous about a particular guest or maybe how the conversation is going to go, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. My body is giving me natural energy to be more articulate, to be more on my toes. I stand for my podcast as well, as you can see, if you're watching on YouTube and it just makes me feel a bit more agile. And I know that maybe I'm nervous before a particular cold call or a, a follow-up call to a customer I'm delivering bad news to. Yeah. The, the butterfly start in your stomach. You're a little bit, you're, you're talking a little bit quicker and with somebody with a Scottish accent, we're naturally quite fast talkers. And <laughs> just making sure that you realign and you, you, you kind of realize that these aren't nerves that are going to sabotage my performance. This is like the kind of fight or flight energy that's been created in me from a primal perspective to enable me to perform my absolute best. But uh, Alan, I have absolutely loved this conversation. I'm sure the listeners have as well. Where should they head towards to continue the conversation with you? Oh, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I enjoyed it immensely. Um, if anyone's interested in any of my speaking programs or services, you can just go to allensteinjr.com. Uh, I'm also very accessible and very responsive on social media. And I'm at Alan Stein Jr. Uh, on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, so if there was part of this that, that you enjoyed and you want to share a story or you want to ask a question or keep the conversation going, just shoot me a DM on any of those platforms. And then if you're interested in either one of my books, uh, Raise Your Game or Sustain Your Game, uh, you can find those on Amazon or Audible or wherever you like to get books and audiobooks. Beautiful, Alan. Let's take it home. Thank you very much for joining me, listeners, and I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.